much as I believe we have to do something, I even more strongly believe that we have to get it right. Unfortunately, I don't believe House Bill 2020B in its current form gets it right enough for me to vote yes today. Madam Speaker, I'd like to make a few things clear. As a member of the Energy Trust Board, I represented rural communities for eight years, ensuring that the public purpose charge that is the cornerstone of the Energy Trust was equally distributed across the state, urban and rural, that everyone had a voice. And they were working toward investments in efficiency and conservation and renewable power projects, both urban and rural. During that same time, the city of Coos Bay built the first LEED certified building on the Oregon coast. It was a new fire station. There were many doubters in the beginning in my community, including my husband, who at the time was a city councilor. But with a great deal of education from the very capable staff of the Energy Trust, a lot of encouragement and cajoling, that building is now a source of pride in my community, and it's changed the way people think. As a port commissioner, I traveled to three countries supporting a deep water offshore wind project because I knew that some of the best wind on the planet lies a few miles offshore of the west coast of the United States between Coos Bay and San Francisco. This was verified by the Department of Energy and at the federal level, who was involved in the project at that time as well. Gigawatts of power, Madam Speaker. The potential is tremendous. We failed at the first attempt. The project was a bit ahead of its time, some say, but we will one day tap that resource. Speaking of coastal renewable energy opportunities, I've always had a bone to pick with my friend from the Central Coast, because my district also fought for the wave energy testing facility that now lies off the coast of Newport. I have 5.8 kilowatts of power on my house, something my husband will th wasn't real thrilled with, but uh, we negotiated through it, and now I'm clicking away and happy to be so. All sources of renewable power are critical to our future, whether it's wind, wave, solar, hydro, geothermal, battery storage, all of these things are important. In the 2017 transportation package, we made significant investments in transit. We tiered our registration and title fees and uh, set the tone for the nation to differentiate between vehicles that are highly um, efficient and those that are not. We incentivized, in a very small way, Oregonians to purchase electric vehicles with the goal of driving down emissions. And someday, we're going to get that money back in the Connect Oregon program, colleagues. Uh, Madam Speaker, the point is I'm not a climate denier. Uh, in fact, I'm deeply concerned about how to make the changes that we have to make as a state and as a society to combat climate change. But colleagues, I have two problems. Madam Speaker, you trusted me with a gavel as the co-chair of the Joint Transportation Committee for two sessions. I thank you for that honor and that privilege and that responsibility. Colleagues, it's a responsibility that I take very seriously. I consider myself a steward of Oregon's transportation system, and I've spent much of this session following the interplay between House Bill 2020B and the 2017 Transportation Package especially issues pertaining to the Highway Trust Fund, how we preserve, maintain, and improve our entire transportation system. And it leaves me very deeply concerned. How do we keep a promise to improve the transportation system through eight years of gas tax increases and 10 years of implementation under House Bill 2017 when the trust fund will now be losing money? You've heard the estimates, somewhere in the neighborhood of up to 18 billion over our 30-year period. Excuse me, Representative, Representative Gomberg yields his time. Please continue. Thank you, Representative. It seems unclear how we mitigate that loss. How can the cost increases to motorists and freight movers, our truckers, not have a significant negative impact on the economy of the state? These costs will trickle down to all Oregonians. How do we meet and maintain cost responsibility, our constitutional charge in a changing system and move toward road usage fees, which must be a part of our path forward as we electrify? What are the possible constraints on the state's ability to bond beyond the planned projects called out in House Bill 2017 as we move forward? 
And there are the unresolved constitutional questions regarding the Highway Trust Fund and the Common School Fund issue. Madam Speaker, we raised the gas tax 10 cents in 2017 in the package, and colleagues, Oregonians trusted us to do that, knowing we weren't going to hit them again for 10 years. That was our pledge. It's a pledge I, with a good conscience, can't break. But most importantly, how do we lower emissions in the transportation sector when there is not a clear path to electrification infrastructure or fleet conversion on a large scale, enough to, be a, to target the, uh, the goals that are stated in the 2035 and the 2050 goals? I see many unresolved transportation issues in House Bill 2020B. Telling our constituents to trust us and that we'll fix it later is not very comforting, I fear. But Madam Speaker, when I take off my transportation chair hat and put on my House District 9 hat, I have a bigger problem. We've been in a recession on the South Coast for 40 years now. We have not recovered the way much of the rest of Oregon has. You've all heard the stories. A case in point, the closure of the, closure of the GP mill recently. This is personal for me. It's why I run for office. It's to protect my communities who've been struggling for quite some time. I fear for my constituents who struggle. I fear for my businesses who struggle. As you know, House District 9 is far away from urban centers. You've heard today, this means that my constituents drive more. They will have higher costs. My businesses have higher costs when it comes to transportation as well. It costs more to move goods to market. So what options will they have? Madam Speaker, I fear that with all the good and important work that we have done in this chamber in the past several legislative sessions, including the minimum wage increase, paid sick leave, pay equity, the transportation package, the Student Success Act, one of the most important things we've done in this building in decades, and the potential for a paid family leave bill coming very, very soon, which are all cost drivers. We put ourselves in danger of hitting critical mass for our constituents and for our businesses, particularly in our poor and our rural communities. We have accomplished a great deal. But for rural coastal Oregonians and the businesses on our coast, how much cost is too much? I honestly don't know how I go home and look my 650,000, I'm sorry, whoa, that's way too many, 65,000 constituents in the eye and tell them it's going to be okay. Yes, your prices are going up for fuel again. Your home heating will be more expensive over time. Your natural gas costs will increase over time. How do I tell them it's going to be okay when I don't believe it myself? And what point does this burden become too great to bear for our small rural communities, our constituents and our businesses? Colleagues, I believe that climate change must be responded to, but 2020B is not a plan of action that generates climate improvements significant enough to justify the price rural businesses and low-income Oregonians will be asked to bear. Ultimately, I don't believe that this is a plan of action that improves the lives of rural constituents in places like House District 9. And so I must very respectfully, Madam Speaker and colleagues, vote no today. Thank you. Thank you, Representative.